Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delighteth. I'll put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. For thus says God, Yahweh, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walk therein. I, Yahweh, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am Yahweh, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. Sing unto Yahweh a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The inhabitants that Kedar doth in the villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto Yahweh and declare his praise in the islands. Yahweh shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holden my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all the herbs. I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. And I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness like before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. Hear ye deaf and look ye blind that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as Yahweh's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but he heareth not. Yahweh is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honourable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth, for a spoil and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not Yahweh? He against whom ye, we have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury, fury of his anger and the strength of battle. It hath set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. So with those words now, as an introduction, I'll hand the class over to Brother Peter. Thanks, Pete. Well, thank you very much, Brother John, and good evening, brothers and sisters and our young people. Um, the Almighty God has set in place a tremendous 
um, tapestry of ways that he convinces men to, to see his message. And one of the marvelous ways that he teaches people is by parallels. And he does this in a way that uh, we're familiar with in, in the prophecy of Zechariah in chapter nine. And um, I don't have time to, to walk you through um, Zechariah chapter nine, but some of you will be familiar that the Lord Jesus Christ himself and Alexander the Great are played against each other to show the great two champions of the world uh, with great uh, and, and different um, ends and absolutely different um, outcomes. And so um, in uh, Zechariah 9, we, we find then that, um, that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is, is portrayed as being a great king. But he's a great king that comes into the city of Jerusalem lowly and walk, um, riding on a, on a foal of an ass. And we get a great picture of Alexander the Great, who has crossed the world on his mighty steed Bucep Bucephalus. And so these two men, seen as being the greatest men of history, are portrayed against each other with great uh, and, and different outcomes. And so the, the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ would... Um, um, would, uh, would in, uh, in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 5, he would defend people. But uh, regarding the outcome for Alexander in chapter 9 and verse 3 and 4, he would be cast out. The results for Alexander would be one of sorrow. Those of Jesus Christ would be of rejoicing greatly. Uh, for Alexander, he himself would be a king that perished and he would kill many kings as well. But in the case of Jesus Christ, he would be a king coming with lowly and bringing peace. As far as the blood of Alexander, God would take the blood out of his mouth. But in the case of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ would be effective and it would, it would be the cause of life for all of his followers. Now, just excuse me just one moment. I'm trying to, I'll need to try and see whether I can just move this little thing. Yep, sorry. I can't see all the screen there. So Alexander and Jesus Christ then are, are painted as a, an absolute contrast by the prophet Zechariah. But when we come back to Isaiah 42, our reading tonight, what we find is that Part of the work of Jesus Christ was unfulfilled in the prophecy. And so in Isaiah 42 and verse 1 and verse 4, it says that, Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delighteth, clearly a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But he says this, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall, not be, he shall not fail nor be discouraged until he has set judgment in the earth and the isle shall wait for his law. And so although the application of this prophecy can clearly be seen to be the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated in his crucifixion and, uh, um, and the, uh, the, the, um, the fulfilling of all of the obedient requirements that he did, um, and the coming Gentile judgment um, in the future, the, the role of, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles um, was extended to the Apostle Paul. And so in verse 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul then becomes um, Jesus Christ given as a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles and to bring prisoners from the prison. Now, that's the very language that Zechariah the prophet in chapter 9 would pick up and say that Jesus Christ would be uh, meek and lowly, riding on an ass, coming into Jerusalem, and he would speak peace to the Gentiles. Now, we know that when he came to Tyre and spoke to the Syrophoenician woman, he said, I can't speak to you. I've come for the lost sheep of, of, the, of, of Israel. And so the Apostle Paul then was commissioned by the Lord himself when he, on the road to Damascus, said to, to Paul, Lo, I've sent you as an ambassador to bring light to the Gentiles. 
And so the Apostle Paul then extends the parable of Jesus Christ and Alexander the Great. And so the Apostle Paul then becomes a champion who goes through all of the Greek lands and portrays the, the intent and the mission of Jesus Christ himself right through the lands of, of Alexander the Great and through his empire. And so Jesus Christ says to him, doesn't he, in, in Acts chapter 13, uh, Paul says, sorry, that Jesus Christ had said to him, I have been commanded by Jesus saying, I have set you, Paul, to be a light to, to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And, and again from Isaiah, that Yahweh hath formed me from the womb to, to, to be his servant. And saith to me, I will give thee, Paul, for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mightest be my salvation to the ends of the earth, that thou, Paul, mayest say to the prisoners, go forth. And you can see quite clearly then that the language of both Zechariah and Isaiah are predictive of the, of the Apostle Paul himself and applied correctly by himself, Paul in, in Acts chapter 13, as he read himself into, his, into, into the Bible. And so when he read the, the, um, the prophecy of Isaiah, he saw himself as the servant in the same foot as um, Jesus Christ himself. And so he would say to the Galatians, I am like Jesus Christ, evidently crucified amongst you. And so the Apostle Paul then continues then the parallel that Jesus Christ had with Alexander the Great. Because he takes the same, he takes the, exactly the same message and extends the, the, the prophecies to himself. But it's interesting when you turn back then to, to Isaiah chapter 49, where it, where it talks about how Paul was going to be sent to the Gentiles. He also uses this language, which speaks of military conquest. He says of Paul that he would be made, um, his mouth would be made like a sharp sword. He's hid me and made him like a polished shaft. And in his quiver, he's hid me. So Paul was made like a sword and like an arrow. He speaks of thy waste and thy desolate places and the land of thy destruction. Here's all the language of military campaign. And that's the sort of language that Paul himself would pick up. And he would, would use those in his letters to the ecclesias, where he would encourage them to put on the whole armour of God, that we should fight the good fight of faith, that we should um, war a good warfare, that we should be a good soldier, that our weapons are not carnal, and so forth. So all of that language that Paul uses is based then on this great parable that he has back from Zechariah chapter 9 and from Isaiah, that he would stand up against the champion of the, of the cause of, that, of, the, of the Greek world. And he would then show that God would be the champion over all of the forces of the Greek thinking, the Greek morality, and the Greek athleticism and, and prowess. And so Paul himself then, is placed into the record as a comparison to Alexander himself. One of the, one of the features, though, that we find in the prophecy of Isaiah is that the, the servant who would be exalted and made very high would first suffer. And that was true also of the Apostle Paul. And this is where the two paths of Alexander and Paul uh, find their divergence. Because all of the way through his campaigns, Alexander was seeking for personal championship, for personal prowess, for personal looting, and for striving for immediate satisfaction. And that was the lot of Alexander. And so when he, when he comes to, for example, to Troas, one of the places that Paul would go to as well, he would run naked in the, you know, like a mini Olympic games and he would give out crowns to each of the Greek people that participated in those games, saying to all of his troops, if you continue with me, you will get rewards immediately on your success. That was not to be the case for Paul and all those like him. And so Paul understood from the, the prophecy of Isaiah that the crown would come to those who would suffer first. 
And so in Isaiah 42, we, as we've read, that, that uh, although God had put his spirit upon him, he would not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He would be a submissive servant. And we read in verse 12 and 13 that first the Gentiles should give glory unto Yahweh and declare his praise. And then Yahweh would go forth as a mighty man. He would stir up his jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar, and he shall prevail against his enemies. And so this, 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 this campaign that, that Paul would undertake was one of careful and patient endurance, not immediate satisfaction and victory like um, Alexander the Great. And so we'll find then, as we go through um, the, the record of Acts chapter 20 and 21, uh, in fact, it actually encompasses more chapters than that, but, but the, the most pointed examples in those two chapters illustrate quite clearly that Alexander and Paul, although being in exactly the same places, had two different goals and two completely different methods to, to find victory for themselves and for their fellows. But one thing is definitely the same, and that is that Alexander the Great and the Apostle Paul both were driven men. And so the Apostle Paul would go right throughout the then known Roman world. He was a driven man taking the message. And we know that all the things that he went through, that he was stoned and he was shipwrecked three times and that he was left for dead and he was smitten and he was scourged and he was imprisoned. All of these things. And yet, despite that, the Apostle Paul could be a driven man, driven by his, by his consciousness that he was once a, a mocker of the gospel. Sorry, Pat. So Paul, Paul was very conscious that, that he had to make amends of, of what he was, uh, he was guilty of, of, of being an injury to the ecclesia, but also that he was striving for the, the glory of God himself. And so Paul was driven with a purpose. And so when you go through chapter 20 and 21 of, of Acts, we, we find that Paul is described and the men around him are described as being men of great purpose, of great spiritual drive or great carnal drive. And so there was men who laid in wait. And the Greek is, um, is very interesting. It has got the idea of men born with a purpose. And that's what Alexander would think of himself, that he was no ordinary man, that he was actually born to be a man of destiny. Paul himself purposed to go through Macedonia. He was ready to depart. He was minded in himself to go afoot. He was determined to sail. He was bound in the spirit and he comes with a, with a straight course and he launches himself to go to Jerusalem, even though he knew that sorrowing, sorrow and, and difficulty would be there. And I suppose that really then asks us the, makes us ask the question, when we get out of bed in the morning, do we have a plan? Do we, brothers and sisters, have a plan to, to, um, to, to highlight the, the glory of God in our life? That we're going to speak and think of his things rather than the things that are immediately necessary for ourselves? Is that the sort of people that we are? Are we driven with a purpose? And that's what the, the real lesson that we're going to learn out of Acts 20 and 21 and the lessons of Paul standing next to Alexander. So when we go then to, uh, to um, the journey of, of Paul in his third missionary journey, I'd just like to very, very quickly, I, I don't want to go through the detail here because we could spend probably three nights talking about the detail, but, the, but the, these maps will show to you that there is absolutely a remarkable parallel in the places that Paul and Alexander go to. They're sequential and parallel. And so both Alexander and Paul go from Athens uh, and down to Corinth to establish themselves as a foundation point for their journey. And so Alexander goes down and, and he has um, a sequence of, uh, um, of, of battles against different tribes of the Greeks. 
And they all come together to form what they call the League of Corinth before he launches forth to collect his army up in the lands of Macedonia and then go on to his battles across the then known world. It's very interesting too then that the Apostle Paul, having left Athens, comes to Corinth and, and from the record of 2nd of Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, he forms a league based out of 2nd of, of, of Corinthians 8 and 9 to collect money for the poor uh, brethren in Jerusalem. And there is an agreement across the ecclesial world that is formed in Corinth that there would be the necessity to gather funds to support the children, uh, the, um, the brethren in Judah, because they were to go through a time of famine, something that had been predicted before he had left. And so both Alexander and, and uh, the Apostle Paul launch themselves from, from Corinth and go into this campaign. They, they come through Macedonia, they select, uh, they collect an army. And so in chapter 20 and verse 3 and 4, um, Paul selects all of, the, all of the men that are now collecting all of the, the funds from the Gentiles. They then um, join together uh, in the lands of Macedonia, the, the very heartlands of, of um, Alexander himself. Paul then comes from Philippi and across to Asia and comes down to two specific events in, in Acts 20, the same two spectacular events of Alexander's campaign in Asia, that being in Troas and in Miletus. Both Alexander and um, Paul finally make it to Tyre, where um, it says of Paul that he would unladen his burden off his ship at Tyre, in Zechariah 9, chapter, chapter 1, uh, sorry, Zechariah 9, verse 1, would say that there would be a burden that would be coming out of Damascus and it would lay on Tyre. And so the, there's this distinct parallel in language and in location and, and pursuit of the, of the, of the, the um, interests of the great king of the world. And that's the, that's the parallel. And so I, although we'd like, love to spend some time talking about the, the detail, I wanted just to illustrate that both the Apostle Paul and Alexander the Great followed a sequential uh, and um, a journey to almost exactly the same places right across their campaign. Quite remarkable. So, one of the, so in Acts chapter 20, there is a deliberate... There is a deliberate break in the chapter. And in the chapter, there is, there is um, two specific journeys that are given. One is by foot and the other is by sea. One is by foot from Troas to Assos. Uh, and the second is um, a journey of the elders of the ecclesia at Ephesus to come across by road uh, because um, Paul had come in by sea uh, into Miletus. And those two journeys are put then in comparison to each other across the, uh, across the chapter. One reveals a young man, a picture of a young man who is now a resurrected young man who comes out of Troas. The second is a picture of old men at the end of their journey. And the, and the, comment, and the conclusion of Paul's um, um, third missionary journey where he is surrounded by old men and elders. And so there is a deliberate um, journey of life that is, that is painted in the book of Acts and in chapter 20. And the first journey that, that we're introduced to is the one at Paul at Troas. And it's interesting that Paul first is, is demonstrated to be the very spirit of Jesus Christ himself. It shows to us that there was the young man who was in a window. Now, in the Old Testament, the word for window is, is, is kulion, which has got the idea, or chulion, which is the, is the idea of churl. And we understand, we understand the idea of churl. It's something that's turned around and it's, and, it's, and it's turned until it's a real pain. It's the same idea in the Hebrew. It's got the idea to bore a hole in something. And so you perforate a wall or pierce a wall. And it's a picture of Jesus Christ, isn't it? So here's a young man who's going to be pierced. It's, a, it's an event of much speaking. 
and Jesus Christ himself would be a declaration of the principles of God so that all men in Jerusalem would know of that event. It would be the time of unleavened bread for Paul. It would be the time of the death of Passover for our Lord. The disciples went before and they're found in an upper room. And in the time of Christ, the disciples would go before and prepare an upper room where they symbolically would join with Jesus Christ in the events of his death. It would be a deep sleep. And then the man would fall from the, from the window and uh, be apparently dead on the ground. The Lord Jesus Christ would also um, be seen on the ground. And, but in, in this uh, falling into a deep sleep, I believe there is a, uh, a reflection then that there would be a, a long-standing sleep that had existed from the time of Adam right till the time of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ would represent all of those men that all that are from Adam have sinned, have died, and all those in Jesus Christ would be made alive. And then Paul goes down, doesn't he? And what a marvellous picture, isn't it, of the, Lord, of, of the Lord himself. How the Lord himself comes down and now he shares his death with us and he, he stretches himself out on the ground. He stretches himself out and he, and, and he embraces this young man the same way as our Lord then and bears our, our iniquities. And he becomes a representative of us as we become a representative of him so that we are buried in baptism in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And so this marvellous picture that Paul then paints is that of the Lord Jesus Christ as well, isn't it? It's a marvellous challenge to, that, um, of, of sin and death that's been overcome by both Paul and Jesus Christ. But in our parallel, we're also interested in another man because when Alexander the Great comes to Troas, he does something that's, well, similar, but very different. He comes to Troas to present himself as the, invul inv uh, the, uh, the invulnerable young man, Achilles. So Achilles was the man of legend, wasn't it? He was the man, remember, that, that his mother had taken him to the, to the river Styx and holding him by his heel, dipped him in the in the in the river and then pulled him out so that he himself would never ever be touched by death again and so he was made like like an, like the gods himself and so that he himself would never die but as the as the legend of homer goes that finally a man throws a spear at him doesn't he and, and the spear hits him in the heel and um and achilles dies and so Here's the interesting thing, isn't it? Here is the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ who was going to be bruised in his heel. And yet, despite being bruised in his heel, he would be overcoming sin for all time. And so Alexander comes there and presents himself as the man who's going to take up the legend of Achilles. He was going to be the man who says, who says well, I'm never going to die. I'm going to be like the gods I'm going to be like Achilles. I'm going to overcome and revenge all of the ills that were brought upon the Greek heroes. And that was the spirit of Alexander when he comes to Troas. And so there is a great contrast then, isn't there? So Paul was quite happy to be associated with lying on the ground with the Messiah. Alexander, no way was Alexander going to lie on the ground. He comes into the tomb of, 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 um, of, of Achilles and he wants to take the lyre of, of Achilles to sing all the songs of the, of the, the great victories of the, of the Greek heroes. And so Alexander comes with a spirit of saying, there's nothing that's ever going to stop me. And so Paul comes as a representative and Alexander comes as a, sub, as a substitute. It's interesting that both Alexander and the apostle were called by name. And so when Alexander was, uh, was, was um, at Delphi, that he would, um, he would be declared by name as being the second Achilles and the victor of Troy. It's interesting that when Paul was called to his commission by, Paul, uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ, 
he would say, Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the pricks? And so he was named by the Lord. So the power of Paul representing the Lord Jesus Christ was in the restitution or the restoring of people from the dead, whereas the power of Alexander was one of vengeance. And so this great contrast then is going to be painted as we go through chapter 20 and 21, that Paul and Alexander are on this, maybe on the same um, physical space, but they're on two complete different journeys. So here we are. I want to give you a glimpse then of some of the location of where Alexander and Paul goes. This is the temple of Athena that we can see here to the right. And as we look down here, this is the, the, the water that is, um, that is the, uh, just below the Dardanelles. As you come down, Gallipoli is probably about uh, 50 kilometres, 40 or 50 kilometres up to the, the northwest from here. And so this is the, the temple where Alexander had come and made an offering on, the, on the, uh, the outside of the round altar outside of the temple. And he goes into the, into the very holiest of holies in this temple. And it's interesting that he comes here and he takes out the tunic of, Ale of Achilles himself and takes the tunic and puts it on himself and says, I am now going to be the resurrected Achilles. I'm the man that's never going to die again. And he takes that legend and that, that tunic then right through to the, to the time that he would die. And it's very, very interesting that Caligula, uh, it says of Caligula that he would actually take the tunic of, of Alexander out of his sarcophagus. And it's got um, some statues of him wearing the very, um, the very tunic of Alexander himself and possibly Trajan as well later. If you have a close look at the, um, the image of Trajan, on the, on the column of Trajan in the Forum in Rome, it appears that probably that Trajan was wearing Alexander's tunic as well. And so here at Troas, it says, uh, the enthusiasm of Alexander was kindled at the tomb of Achilles by the memory of his heroic ancestors. Here, he girded on their armor. And from this goal, he started to overthrow the august dynasties of the East. And here's a picture of the round altar um, to, the, to the east of the, of the Temple of Athena that Alexander the Great offered on before he, put that, uh, before he put that tunic on. Now Lysimachus, who was one of the four generals that succeeded to the power of Alexander, he then later rebuilt this city and he calls it, which I thought was very interesting, he calls it in honour of the man of Macedonia, a term that we're very familiar from when Paul was called from this place sometime back in Acts chapter 16 by a man of Macedonia who said, come across and help us. And helping is what both the Lord and Paul was going to do. Here's a picture of the, the armour of Alexander the Great. And so in the National Museum in, in Naples, they have this mosaic on the wall and uh, you'll notice that there on his breastplate is a picture of Zeus or Apollo uh, on his on his um, on his armor, and he did represented a, a living resemblance of the God Himself. And you'll notice to the uh, right of the picture there that's a, a, a representation of Bucephalus, his great horse. And so from Troas, we find then that there is a, a start of a great journey. And so for the Apostle Paul, it was going to be the journey of being a resurrected young man. He was going to be a resemblance of Jesus Christ himself. He'd lied down on the ground and the spirit of Jesus Christ had raised him from the dead and sent him to be his representative through the world. And so that was the journey of, of the Apostle Paul. But what of, the, what of um, Alexander the Great from Troas? Well, here's, a, here's a, uh, a picture of the port on some of the, the, the stone columns that were at the port. It's interesting that a lot of the stone columns that came from this port were taken later to, to Constantinople and built the new Troas at, at Constantinople. 
And Troas became then the eastern capital uh, um, of the Roman world. And it's interesting that both uh, um, Julius Caesar and, uh, and Constantine um, um, celebrated Troas as being the seat of victory for, um, for the eastern lands taking the spirit of Alexander the Great himself. But it says uh, in, in Homer's, uh, Homer's Iliad, it says about, uh, about one, of the, one of the heroes that he walked off in silence along the shore by the tumbling and crashing surf. And so I believe that when it says that Paul was minded to set himself on foot, there was a divine inspiration that would lead his events to show that Paul himself would take a similar path to Alexander, but with completely different goals and completely different methods. And it says in Homer that some distance off that he would pray to Apollo. And so about sort of 20 kilometers or 25 kilometers to the south of, of Troas um, or Alexander Troas, it's called, um, we find that there is a temple to Apollo. And I believe that this was the, sp this was the place that Alexander the Great would come by foot after his victory at Granicus and his celebrations at Troas. And so Alexander would come here. So the question has to be, well, why did Alexander the, the Great come here? And can we get any glimpses then of the meaning of Paul's walk from Troas to Assos out of what Alexander the Great did? And I believe we can. And here's a map of, of that journey. We see to the north, here is the, the town of Alexander Troas, Troas. It's interesting that the word Troas, incidentally, is the idea of a foot soldier, a man, a soldier who would walk by foot. And so when a, the Apostle Paul and Alexander were to walk to the south, they would go forward as being foot soldiers of their various champions, Alexander of Apollo and Paul of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they walked to the south down to a place called Apollo Smithian and then across to Assos, which is around the corner of the Bega Peninsula. The road came down across here to a river where there was a, there's a bridge that we can find today. And the bridge here um, that sort of that um, the remnants are found in, in the farmer's paddock there, the flagstones were completely smooth. And unlike most city, most bridges and pavements in the ancient world, they're all rutted with the with the marks of either um, continual foot traffic, um, ho um, shoed horses, or or ruts from chariots. And many many places you go through the through the ancient world, you can see those ruts. For example, uh, uh, up at Gadara and at Jerash, you can quite clearly see the ruts in in the pavement stones. But in this road, you can't because there was a tradition that no man would ride his horse or take a chariot into the temple. They would all be foot soldiers. They would be men that were, that were traveling by foot. A very interesting uh, a feature that sort of paralleled the, the work of Paul. And so here's the pavement. Here's the pavement that would lead up to the temple of Apollo Smithian. And that uh, those pavement stones were were were, uh, were very very smooth with no no um, um, chariot wheel marks on them. So here's the words of Homer, and I thought this was very very interesting because it illustrates probably the spirit of Alexander as he moves out of Troas, and the spirit that he's got in his mind, because now as the as the conquering victor or the incipient conquering victor of the Persian armies, he would then say, well, I'm going to revenge all of the great the Greek tragedies of Achilles. And so there was a high priest who Agamemnon would, would capture his daughter. And the, the high priest um, was, was very saddened, obviously, because of this. And so he turns to Apollo in prayer and says, Apollo, I want you to avenge the capture of my daughter. And that's what this, this little section of, of the Homer's Iliad is about. And we'll read this. He says, the old man, afraid, obeyed his, obeyed his words. He walked off in silence along the shore by the, by the tumbling, crashing surf. 
And here's the picture of Alexander and, and the, the Apostle Paul sometime later, that they would themselves walk by road to the south. And some distance off, he prayed to the Lord Apollo, Leto's fair-haired child, God with the silver bowl, protector of Chrissy, sacred Cilia, mighty Lord of the Tenedos, Smithian Apollo, hear my prayer. And so he, he, he gives them all of these titles and he says, well, this is, here's my prayer. If I've pleased you with a holy shrine or burnt bones for you, like some tea. If, if I've given bulls and goats well wrapped in fat, then grant me my prayer. And so here's the spirit of Alexander. There is a, uh, there is a spirit that says, well, if I've done this, then, then you, I have an expectation that you will grant something back to me. And so here's the type of language of, of the spirit of the Grecian power. It's give and take. If I do this for you, God, then you have to give me this. And further to that, he says this. He says, if I've done this and I've given you bulls and goats well wrapped in fat, then force the Danans to pay full price for my tears. And so Apollo he comes down and hears him. And the, and the response of Apollo is that he gets his arrows that he was very famous for. And he would take his arrows and he would shoot all of the people as they were represented as mice. And so, so, the, so the, the um, Alexander would come down now and he would see himself not only as Achilles, but now also as Apollo. And he would say, well, I'm going to go through the whole world and I'm going to force people to pay for all of the terror that they had brought on the Greek empire before. And so he was in vengeance going to take uh, blood on the Persian empire. And that's the spirit of Alexander. But that's not the spirit of the apostle Paul. Here's the spirit of the apostle Paul. It is not possible, he says, that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. So, so the apostle Paul would say that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. There has to be something better. And that is a willingness of spirit that says, I'm willing to be crucified for the interest of God first, that all of my personal desires in life need to be overcome by a driving spirit of God's righteousness. And that's, that's what Hebrews 10 is all about, isn't it? And so here's the spirit of the Messiah in him. And so Christ would say, forgive them, not take vengeance, forgive them. They know not what they do as they took his raiment off him. Interesting, isn't it? So that he's forgiving while the, his raiment and his, and his tunic is taken away and they cast lots for it. And so um, the apostle Paul says, well, okay, if a man asks, he, he says, if it, Christ says, sorry, and the, and the spirit of the apostle Paul says, if a man takes your cloak off you, then give him your, your garments also. And he would commend his spirit into the hands of God. In other words, I'm not doing taking vengeance for myself. God is the grand operator in this. He is the driver of my spirit. And so those two spirits then uh, are seen in juxtaposition in the, in the walking of Alexander the Great and the Apostle Paul as they head down south. And so here we find ourselves then at the temple of Apollo Smithian, where Ap Apollo... Uh, the great god of vengeance, uh, his, his name means the destroyer. And so, so um, Alexander the Great is the great Apollo or the great destroyer of, of all men. And so he is going to be the picture of a man who's going to put many people into the grave. Not one person would ever be taken out of the grave from the actions of Alexander the Great. But the apostle Paul, would bring many prisoners out of the pit. And that's the language, isn't it, of, of Zechariah chapter 9. And so the picture of Alexander, as, sorry, as Alexander as, as Apollo 
the killer of all flesh or the, ven the, the, the man who takes vengeance on everybody else because of in what was perceived as injustice to his family would be the spirit then that would invade not only the Greek world, but pass down right through to our time. And so um, that then is the, is the journey of young men. And it's interesting that when Alexander left um, Greece, he would go to Delphi, which was the place of the, uh, the place of the Oracle. And I feel that probably at the, the temple of Apollo Smithian, we find that just not just a little bit to the north, there's these, these enormous um, chemical vents that, that are seen in this video. I believe probably the same sort of fumes and that were, were, were found in the, in the sacred spring and the Oracle here underneath the temple of, of Apollo Smithian. And so that the, the, um, the high priest would breathe in these fumes in the polonium, what they call the polonium, and uh, they, they would hallucinate and they would see uh, the visions of God speaking to them. And here's a, here's a coin that was, was, was um, minted at Apollo Smithius or Apollo Smithian. And on one side, it's got a picture of Alexander the Great the crowned man, the man wearing the crown. And what's he doing? Well, on the other side, it, it paints him as a picture of Apollo on the other side of the coin, holding an arrow uh, in his bow, ready to smite every man that comes across his path. The two great conquering um, heroes of the Greek world. So as we move further forward then in through the, through the chapter of Acts chapter 20, we're, we're given another journey. And the second journey is a, is a journey of old men. And I believe that what the, the Spirit is showing to us is that a man who then commits his path to being one with the Lord Jesus Christ at the start of the chapter will go right through his life. And the Spirit, although... Um, would be with him, although all of the challenges of life would come to him and try and frustrate his purpose before he gets to the end of his life. And so Paul comes down now, and he's not determined to go by foot, but he joins in the vessel with all his brethren. And he goes now, not as an individual, but as a collective ecclesia, and he's determined to sail and go to Jerusalem. And so he comes to this place here, and, and here's the old port of, of Miletus and, and um, the temple of Athena at, um, at the port. Um, he comes down then by ship and gets off a ship here in this port uh, into the city of Miletus. And he calls the brethren from Ephesus and, um, to come by road, and they walk by road, um, a whole collection of old men like as if it was the Apostle Paul many years later being reflected in them. But the interesting thing is that the second battle is not so much one of, of, of the road, but that that was taken by sea. And so all of the features then of the, of the next journey of Paul, it's all of, of the different ports that he goes through, that he will go through from, from uh, Mytilene, a word that means the mutilators, a reference to the circumcision party that he would contend with uh, that tried to destroy the spirit of his poor collection uh, across the world. He would come down through um, uh, Adramidium, through, uh, through, through, um, through Samos and, and past uh, Tregillium, all separate ports along the way. And here's a picture of Tregillium um, right at the end of the peninsula there, and that's Samos just around the corner to our right, the, the, um, the island where the famous Pythagoras would come from. Now today, the, the, the area of Miletus is actually land. And you'll notice here that, that, um, that even though it's land, it's very low-lying low land and it's, it's swampy and it has these water birds and it's, uh, it's just a very low-lying area. But in the time of Paul, was actually quite a, uh, a quite a deep inlet from the Aegean Sea, and so what ended up happening was that the the water came through here, and just outside of the out of the city of um, of Miletus, here at a place called um, Lede, um, there was a set of islands that 
that protected the entrance to the port from the Aegean Sea to the west. And so Alexander's uh, naval vessels came in here and they, they took the high ground and they forced all of the Persian um, naval forces who were to support the, the men at Miletus. And if they had, Alexander would have never got in there. So very cleverly, Alexander came in here with his naval forces and took the high ground here at, um, at Lay Day and, and established a ring of naval vessels right around the city so that nobody could get in or out with supplies. And so, um, so the, the conquest of Miletus was actually one given by sea. It's very interesting that at the time, Alexander stood on the other side of the sea. He sat down in, in a place called Priene, which is about sort of 20 kilometres or 15 or 20 kilometres further north from Miletus. And he sat there and just let his generals do the work. Again, another reference perhaps that Paul's work had been passed on to others in these elders that were an ecclesia that was developing his work later in his life. So here's a map, um, perhaps of some of the details of, of that last victory of, of Alexander, this, this naval victory that he had. And so we see this black line that comes from the, from the, uh, the north, that's where the, uh, the sailing of um, Paul and his, his um, companions would come in. And they landed at, at Miletus. And when he came in there, he asked the, the uh, elders of Ephesus to do something very unusual. He says, can you please walk to me? Now, this was a considerable effort because it wasn't just a straight line. And even in a straight line, it's still about sort of 40 to 50 kilometers to the north, uh, Ephesus from Miletus. But in the times of Paul, and perhaps I've just taken a stab at where the, uh, where the waters of, um, of, the Gad, of, of this gulf were going to go in, but um, the, the, the road would have diverted considerably to the east. And so these men walked for miles to come down and see, see, um, see Paul. And this is old men we're talking about. You know, these are men with, that needed hip replacements or you know, worn out knees. So, so this was a real effort for them. But one of the interesting things that may not be immediately evident was that in the old days, there was actually a tradition of men walking to Miletus. They would walk from a place called Didyma, which was where a temple to Apollo was um, in the time of Paul and in the time of Alexander. And so this tradition was that men, ancient men, would walk from Didyma, they would catch a boat there, then they would walk from, from Didyma up to Miletus, and there they would sacrifice to, the, to Athena, and, um, and uh, those that would die along the way, they would be buried in what they call the Haroon of Thales, a very famous uh, burial place at, at Miletus. And it was considered the end of a person's course. And so when, when the Apostle Paul would say, I have finished my course uh, in, in both Acts 21 and uh, in 2nd of Timothy chapter 4, there is overtones then of this sacred way that the elders would walk to in, into uh, Miletus. And all along this way, all along this sacred way were milestones and these, these seats that represented the elders who had, had found their position in society for, for some merit of their own. And so all the elders were, were, had these monuments. And so if you were a great chemist or if you were a great physician or a great teacher or a great philosopher, they would make this, this, these statues of you sitting down on a seat and they would place you along this, this sacred way and as you walked to Miletus, you would read and you'd say, well, this elder, he was a tremendous teacher. And, uh, and so, uh, and this man was, uh, well, he was a tr tr tremendous athlete in his life. And so all of the heroes of, of that area would be honoured by a seat along this sacred way. And so I think there was a play, uh, a divine play on the tapestry of the, of the location to say, that, well, um, God is going to honour heroes, but on his own terms. Um, 
And so these men would get off at the, at the Temple of Apollo. And here's a picture, of, um, by the way, of Apollo and Artemis, who were twins. And we know that Apollo uh, was, the, was the, the, the male god and Artemis, or otherwise known as Diana or Diane, uh, from Ephesus. And so there was a joint spirit then in this temple of Didyma. There was the spirit of Apollo and the spirit of Artemis that was represented in, in this temple. And you'll notice the navel type of, um, or, the, or the sea sort of um, uh, features of Apollo. Here's Apollo with um, the tail of a fish. It's a picture of Apollo being the victor of the sea. And it's quite interesting then that, that, that um, this was the first of, and probably the only real, um, sea battle that Alexander ever had in his life. And so here's the sacred way. And as you walk along, you can st still see remnants of the, of the sacred way as it extends all the way from Didyma right down to, um, to Miletus. And at the end of it, you would come to the temple. Um, and just before the temple was this huge mausoleum where men were, all of the heroes of, of the area were, were buried. And along the way, there was these, these milestones. And it would say there's this much time or this much distance to go to, to Miletus. And along the, along the way were these men. And they were noted, I've taken a photograph here of their feet, because these were the men that were walking along that way. And they were honoured for their dedication to the Greek culture. And here out at the British Museum is one of those monuments that were carved in marble of a man sitting on a seat uh, that was taken from along this sacred way from, from Didyma to Miletus. And at the end of it, here is all of the, here is all of the wonderful things of modern life. Um, Miletus was the, was the city that was the metropolitan sort of city, the greatest metropolitan city, Greek city in, in all of Asia. And so when, when, the, when the men came up there, they wanted all of the enjoyments of life. That was what they were walking there for. But when they came there, what they found was really, this was the burial place of all Greek heroes. So when the apostle Paul comes then to Miletus, he, he approaches the, the, the old men and he says, well, guess what? There's going to be frustrations and there's going to be dilemmas along the way. And so throughout chapter 20, the end of chapter 20 and through chapter 21, if it presents men that are, have this unresolved, this untamable un, um, and, and un, um, un, unrestrained spirit like Alexander the Great, well, and, and like the Apostle Paul, here was going to be men whose spirit was going to be challenged. And so the Apostle speaks to these men and says, well, look, out of yourself is going to be men who are going to be not sparing the flock. They're going to draw away disciples after them. They're going to apostatize the truth. And so that spirit that I've instilled in you, brethren, is going to be challenged. And so Paul understood then that his spirit was going to be put under pressure. And although he was going to be raised with the spirit and life and vigor of the Lord Jesus Christ, like we are, he also understood that the passage through life would come with its challenges. And so we find that he, when, when he had purposed and he was determined and he was driven to go in, in, in the early part of chapter 20 and, and glimpses throughout the record from there on, we find that he tarries and he tarries and he's bound and he's delivered. And he comes to, to chapter 21 and verse 13 and he said even his own companions were to break his heart. And we'll come back and have a chat about that in just a second. And so it really raises the question, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? We go through life, we have, we have understood the spirit of, of, of Jesus Christ. We understand that we need to be driven people. We know that we should apply energy and vigour to the things of the truth. But in the last days particularly, we find that we're challenged in our application to the truth, that our spirit that our driving passion for the things of the Lord Jesus Christ and of our God are sometimes diminished because of all of the attractions of the world, of the distractions of the world, 
of all of the immediate satisfaction that the world has to offer. And it blurs our heart to, the, to our spirit, our driving spirit for the truth. And brothers and sisters, the sad thing about this is that it was the very companions of Paul himself that were, that were the thing that most worried Paul. He says, it's you that are going to break my heart. And like, like Peter before him, he, says, uh, he said, take pity on yourself, he says, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, 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 and Jesus was to turn to him and say, you're being an adversary to me. Get behind me. And in that is a great pathos. It's a pathos that the Lord Jesus Christ felt the pangs of that appeal. That the very appeal to take pity on oneself was something that could have possibly changed the course of, of history for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in his desperate clinging onto that spirit, he said to his beloved disciples to say, please, Peter, get behind me because you're breaking my heart. And so even the Lord and, and, our, and our apostle Paul, our brother Paul, the great men that stand up against um, Alexander the Great, they themselves have the foible that they themselves had the potential of failure because of the, the strong and, and the incredibly um, alluring um, uh, opportunity given uh, to people who would seek their own sort of self-interest. And that's a dangerous and, a, and an incredibly dangerous spirit that can, can touch us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? That we open up our minds just for a second and say, well, I deserve something. There has to be something done for me. And it breaks our resolve to serve God 100%. And that's what we should be giving him. We should be giving him all of our heart, our soul, and our minds. And so the, so the elders uh, um, would come and join Paul. And they would come from the, one of the seven wonders of the world, um, the, the Temple of Artemis, that would burn, would burn down, incidentally, on the night that Alexander was born. Uh, whether that's, uh, that's a, a fact, but it's an interesting historical um, uh, enigma that, that it's reported that the temple of Artemis in Ephesus was, was actually burnt the night that, that um, Alexander was born. And so the men that would come from here would walk down to meet the Apostle Paul here at the place where all famous men would, would be buried. And this would be the end of their course. This would be the end of the course where they would fall on the ground with the Apostle Paul and figuratively say, we're dead with you. And, and the Apostle John would deliver a message from our Lord to them and say, you have left your first love. Your love, that your passion for the truth has been taken away from you. And it's time for us to overcome and, and drive ourselves forward with the, with the help of our loving Heavenly Father in that regard. And um, a little to the, to the, uh, to the, to the east, nor, um, the southeast from here, would be one of the other seven wonders of the world, the mausoleum at Halicarnassus, which was the site for Alexander's next battle. And so both were pitted with these, these enormous um, sarcophagus or these enormous sort of mausoleum where famous men were to be buried. And that's the battle sites that, uh, that meet over with Paul speaking to the elders to say there's going to be a deterioration and a failure of the truth. So it's interesting then. What is the question then? The question that we have to learn out of all of this. So, what is our war? If we're going to stand next to the uh, the Apostle Paul and to Alexander the Great, what is our war? Well, our war is being committed to the truth, isn't it? And it's interesting then. So, when he comes then in Acts twenty one verse sixteen, it says that he, they brought with him one Nason of Cyprus. Um, the word Cyprus, by the way, is the word for love. He was an old man, an old disciple, one from the beginning, it's, it's really in the Greek. So it's one that's been from the beginning and he's still alive, one that has been driven by love. And he says to him, come and lodge with me. 
And here's the answer to the, to the dilemma of Paul. If his brothers and sisters would break his heart, God in his great mercy would send somebody to strengthen him. In the case of the Lord, it was an angel. In the case of Paul, it was this man, this man, Nason of Cyprus. And we can do this for each other, brothers and sisters. We can be the people who can lift us up off the ground. We are the ones that can be the, the ones in the end of our life who will still hold the love of the truth. And so, brothers and sisters, here is the importance of, of understanding and appreciating our old people, our old brothers and sisters in the meeting. We can look at our brothers and sisters in the meeting who consistently come each week. They come as an example of the retained love of the truth over many and, and uh, difficult years. And so they took them. They took the Apostle Paul and said, in your journey to Jerusalem, we are with you. You should lodge with us. And here's a, here's a demonstration of the, of the marvellous power of the example of pulling somebody else aside and saying, you're committed to a great cause. So we're now familiar then that Alexander and Jesus Christ and Paul are put next to each other. The question then is, what about us? Well, I'll draw your attention back to a verse out of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 13. And it's a very interesting one because he says, not only is he going to work with this king who's lowly and riding a, an ass into Jerusalem, but now he's going to take up sons. And so this king has sons. And he says, I'm going to incorporate your sons in, in your journey. And he says to Judah that I am going to bend you, Judah, like a bow. I'm going to fill the bow with Ephraim like arrows. And then when I've done that, I will have raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece. And so, brothers and sisters, we are then placed in contrast to Alexander the Great. You and I are placed standing next to the champion of the Greek world, the man who overcome and made the greatest empire that anybody has ever known. And so it's a very interesting uh, use of expression here because when God says that he has bent the bow and filled it with Ephraim, I want you just to pause and think about how that actually happened in old time. So what they had was these wooden instruments that they used to use for bows and they would lay them on the ground and because they were so stiff and powerful, they actually had to lean on them. They would actually put their foot on their knee and they would reach out with one hand and put the string or the sinews, the, 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 um, the, the, um, the weaved sinews of animals on one end. And then by putting their feet on this bow, they would stretch their hands out and then bend the bow to attach the other end of the string. And the, the bow was then ready for, for use. But in the, in the very actions of filling a bow with its string is actually the, the figure of a man being crucified. Here is a wooden instrument that's put on the ground. The man is then lying over it and he stretches his hands out to embrace this wooden instrument. He then becomes a man that's been crucified. And so brothers and sisters, we too share the, the task of, of being crucified with Jesus Christ as Paul was. And it's interesting then that when he's raised up thy sons, it says, they're going to be sons of Zion, a word that means sign. We're going to be men of sign, men that are uh, uh, resemblance, men that resemble the, the great one who has been bent like a bow before. Yeah. So... So that brings us then to the end of the journey. And I've just got one or two verses here that I'd like to share with you before we, we, we finish for the night. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, he picks up all of the features or a lot of the features out of Acts 20 and 21, and he brings them to bear again in his last message. And he says this, he says, I'm now ready to be offered. And here's the driving spirit, isn't it, of, the, of, of Paul. And here he is as an old man, 
He's gone through all of the challenges of life. He's gone through the, the, all the turmoil of Jerusalem, dragged off to Rome, all of the intervening years until finally Nero, that crazy man Nero, drags him off to Rome again. And he says, I'm still ready to be offered. He had a driving passion in life to fulfill the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ amongst the Gentiles. And so now he said, I'm ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. And what does he do? He says, well, he calls out to others. He says, do your diligence to come shortly to me. In other words, brothers and sisters, Paul is now calling out to each one of us to share the same journey that he has had. He's saying, do your diligence. In other words, take that spirit upon you. Show diligence, show drive, show passion for the truth so that you can come to share the experiences of being crucified with Jesus Christ and accept the crowns that come. And he says, well, the, the Lord is going to give me crowns, but not to me only, but to those also who love his appearing. But he says a couple of very interesting things. In the next couple of verses, he says this, the cloak or the tunic that I left at Troas, when thou comest, bring with thee, but, a, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith, the man who builds brass men, did me much evil. And it's interesting that he drags the name of Alexander the Great into his last message. And he says that the spirit of Alexander, Alexander is going to do much damage to the truth. And so, brothers and sisters, on our journey to then of our association with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the spirit of Alexander the Great that's going to destroy us from getting to the end. And he explains what that spirit is, doesn't he, in chapter 3 and verse 2, where he says that men would be lovers of their own selves more than lovers of God. And so the very thought that was going to break the heart of Paul and break our spirit, our driving spirit to do be crucified men with Jesus Christ that was the thing that was going to destroy both Paul and us if we were to let it take gain. And he says in the middle of all of that, he says, if we love ourselves more than loving God, then we have our truce, that is our covenant, broken with God. And so, brothers and sisters, that's the message of, of Paul to us, that he would bring forth the blood of a covenant that he would bring us out of the prison house, that he would bring us to a light of the gospel, that we might be champions over that selfish cause that is now so pervading in our life and in, 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 in society around us. Brothers and sisters, let's not give space to the very thought that we deserve something. Let's not give space then that somehow we deserve or have things that should satisfy us now when the crown and the marvellous gift of being with Jesus Christ, the great champion of the world, is just around the corner. Thank you.